Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian, and I am joined by my great friend, Dr. Peter Carmichael, Director of the Civil War Institute. How are you doing, Pete? I, I'm doing fine, John. Um, and uh, we have a special guest with us uh, this evening. We have Dr. Zach Fry. Uh, Dr. Fry is a assistant professor of military history at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And Zach, I believe, has not been there quite a year. Is that correct, Zach? Uh, yeah, I, I moved here in uh, August, um, I think, last August. So, so I got to give a, a little more background about Zach. He is from uh, the great state of Ohio. You are our second guest from Ohio. We had Angie Zombeck. I don't know if you know Angie. Uh, Zach is from Ohio, did his undergrad at Ohio State. That's Kent correct, State. is it not? Yeah. And then did your PhD as well at Ohio State, uh, working right. under Mark Grimsley, a noted Civil War historian. And you would think that a young man who's lived his entire life in the great state of Ohio, gone to Ohio State, but he's what? He is a Michigan fan. Is that right? Wow. Is that, that's right. Is that's, it not Zach? That's a remarkable thing. I'm going to sign off right now. But that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's you know what, me. Zach, if we got that wrong, you know, it's our research team. And John, I've been getting on you about that. Our researchers, you know, we rely heavily upon them to get these little bios, you know, biographical facts correct. <laughs> right. We even have in our notes that your cat, you called your cat, you call your cat, Bo. For course, right, right. right. That's wrong too. Boy, this we've gotten off to a rough start here. Wow. And again, it's our research team. It's not John's fault. It's not my fault. Mm. Um, no, no, we'll blame the research team. Always blame the research team. Yeah. The nameless research team. They're interns, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I met Zach uh, when he was ten years old. Uh, Gary Gallagher and I were giving a tour, a tour that was sponsored by uh, Bob Mayer. Uh, Bob Mayer is a great friend and a great supporter of Zach. Bob Mayer had a Civil War, um, in essence, touring company. And so there was Zach, 10 years old. I mean, just full of enthusiasm. And I'll never forget, we were, on, uh, we were in McPherson's Woods. And we would say, Zach, we're not sure what that monument is. Go find out, Zach. And he would sprint off and he would come running back. And uh, it was, you know, it's always a joy to see a young person, I mean, truly a young person, have so much uh, enthusiasm and passion for the past. But you know what? It's even better when you see how that young person has gone all the way up the ranks here and has published a first-rate book, A Republic in the Ranks. We'll be talking about that this evening. And we are also going to announce for the very first time that UNC Press, University of North Carolina Press, publisher of this book, it's part of the Civil War America series. They have graciously given the viewers of this show a 40% discount. That's almost scandalous. Zach, no, you're not going to make any money off this book if they do that to you. Man, what were they thinking? Not doing that for my book. I mean, Never going to want to come back on with us again. Yeah. So we have a code. And I don't know if we can pull that up yet, or we can do it later, John. If you it's like, it's in the it's in the video description, uh, which which will, everyone can see on the side. Well, at the end of the show as well, I might say the code so people can write it down as well. So again, very nice of UNC Press to do this, forty percent off of Zach's book. And I want to note that this is Zach's first book, mm -hmm. uh, based, of course, on his dissertation. And maybe you'll have an opportunity to talk to us a little bit about working with Mark Grimsley, whose book, Hard Hand of War, is uh, it's just a brilliant piece of scholarship. A lot of books that don't stand the test of time, and Professor Grimsley's most certainly has and will. So Zach, to get things started this evening, I, I want you to uh, describe the moment when he got that box from UNC Press, and you opened it up, and this, this baby came out. And we should note, Zach's going to be a father. When is it again? July 27th? Is that what Correct. July 27th. That's right. July 27th. Massive congrats for that. That's and right. if it's, uh, I mean, if it's going to be a boy, you got to name him Woody Hayes, do you not? <laughs> well, how about my favorite Buckeye, Bobby Knight? That's not bad. 
<laughs> of course, of okay, course. Just, right. just follow that right. one. Follow that one. <laughs> right. So Zach, take us to that moment. You opened that box. Tell us, who are those feelings you pick up this book after years and years of work of putting this thing together? You know, what was, I think what was, what stuck out to me the most was seeing so much work and so many years of work compressed into one relatively small product. <laughs> you know, it's, it was, it was, you know, the biggest thing um, that I had ever seen, but also sort of the, sort of the smallest in some ways, because yeah, it was just so much work compressed into a really, really small, but very polished by UNC Press product. Um, so yeah. it was, it was excellent. It was surreal. Yeah. Yeah. A very yeah. powerful one as well. Uh, well, I also want to note that um, with any dissertation, it is uh, a piece of original scholarship. And we all know that in our field of Civil War history that there's a lot that gets published and a lot of it's quite good, but a lot of it that doesn't really based upon any original research and going out in the archival trenches and digging away. And this book, right, where I think it's hard for readers to fully appreciate is the product of just back-breaking research, which of course we all enjoy. But that is one of the things that John and I, when we talked about public history and popular history and academic history, I think one of the things that I didn't probably stress enough is that academic books that often get a bad rap for not being accessible, not being readable, which is not true. I mean, in some cases it is. In some cases. But not, but not, not true with Civil War America. <laughs> but what distinguishes an academic book is that it makes a new contribution based on original research. And Zach didn't just knit together a bunch of books, Bruce Catton or Stephen Sears, I'm sure he relied upon them, but he went out there and he did original work and the consequence of it is a very, very important and valuable book. So Zach, I'm gonna get us started here with, you know, give us sort of what is the big research question that led you into this project? Mm -hmm. As soon as I got into grad school, um, I started really toying with the idea of the Army of the Potomac's love for George McClellan, actually even before grad school, heck, as an undergrad um, in the Gettysburg semester um, at Gettysburg College. It was, it, was, um, it was one of those questions that fascinated me. And it's fascinated a lot of Civil War historians, I think, with this question of why the Army of the Potomac, which was so... Um, devoted to George McClellan for much of the Army's existence, went from worshiping him in 1862 to voting overwhelmingly against him in 1864. Um, so that question fascinated me. And I, I really wanted to look at it from the perspective of the Army's attitude toward McClellan. There's been plenty of research and plenty of excellent, you know, tremendous um, secondary work on what Union soldiers thought about Abraham Lincoln, what they thought about emancipation, what they thought about the direction of the war in big picture terms, but very little, I thought, that was, that was satisfying about what the Army, like how the Army viewed McClellan in particular. And so that was initially like what got me into the project. And then I realized, I think, why the, um, why the topic of the Army's attitude toward Lincoln and toward emancipation and everything was so um, was, was, was so important for historians because it was, as I waded into it, impossible to untangle the two. So you know, let's step word, back a little, can we step back yeah. just a little bit, right? So uh, I suspect a lot of our viewers, um, they hold that very standard view of George B. McClellan mm -hmm. as you know, the general who not only had the slows, but was incapable of really taking ownership for any of his mistakes, always scapegoating or always turning to the president and asking for more, more, more. And so he is, you know, in the eyes of many, fairly unlikable. And for Civil War historians who, let's be honest, we're not, you know, I would say the most comedic group of people, but thank God for George B. McClellan because he has been comedic fodder for Civil War historians. So here you come and you're like, you know what? I want to look at this guy 
what got you over the hump here? And we can all see, of course, he's looking right over your shoulder as well. He is, he is looking, looking right over my shoulder, but, but there's also a bust of Lincoln as Lincoln, well. Lincoln, is that, is that, and is that Meade on the other side or is that Lee? Yeah, it's Meade. Yeah. It's, it's, it, I'm being I mean, scared now. Where did you find the Meade statue? I mean, good God, I didn't even know they existed. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it's, wow. Peter, this is the Civil War. You can find, you can find busts yeah. of anything if you want, yeah. Yeah. if you're willing to pay the right price for it. Yeah. Um, he a bobblehead, that's all. <laughs> I, I do have I do have plenty of bobbleheads at work, just not at home. Um, I I think the um, what what got me over the hump was just realizing that as I looked at a lot of the sources from especially 1863, which seemed to really be the the turning point of the army's political story, um, the love for McClellan in large parts of the army evaporates. And it was really interesting to try to figure out what went on there and why that was the case. Um, and so that's why I say it ended up bringing me naturally to all of these very important questions about what soldiers thought about the meaning of the war and their attitudes toward Lincoln, because they were very much intertwined. Um, and I saw McClellan as almost a, a casualty of that. You know, here McClellan is loved by the army and then by late 63 and certainly into 64 the union soldiers the soldiers in the army of the potomac who served the longest fought the hardest um came to really resent a great deal about this man um and so it was really it was really interesting to look into that and try to figure out why wow. So I remember my last question here, John, and, and turn it over to you. My last big question is this. You know, you think of the Army of the Potomac and we all appreciate that it was an army for a, a significant amount uh, uh, of time that was, I would say, poorly led, poorly managed, uh, that the officers never um, gave the enlisted men the type of leadership that was often just, you know, their, their bodies were, were squandered on the battlefield, right? Mm. And, and so, so you see the Army of the Potomac as a unified force, right? That these are men who came together, who coalesced because of what they had endured, what they had gone through. In, in many ways, it was sort of us against them mentality because they could never find that officer who could lead them to victory until Gettysburg. And so, I ask you this again, setting up this question, that perception of, of unity um, in the rank and file, in the Army of the Potomac, that sense of unity, how would you then respond to that observation of mine? That these, this was, these were men, they didn't care about politics. These are men who believed in each other as comrades because they had gone through the trial of combat. Well, they certainly did. Um... They certainly did become a, a, a cohesive unit um, based on their shared experience of combat and not just combat, but campaigning, um, the drudgery of campaigning, the boredom of camp life. Um, but at the same time, what I came to realize by virtue of how, how, how really vociferous it's the, only, it's the only term I can I can use for it. How really vociferous the political um, contention was at every level of the army. We talk, you know, plenty of books written about the high command and the politics involved there. But the more I dug into it, the more I I found how vociferous the politics were at the junior officer level, and what the effect of that was on the enlisted men. This was a civil war in which politics were absolutely unavoidable for a mass citizen army. Um, and so what I found was that uh, certainly by the middle of the war, the junior officers, the captains, the majors, the colonels um, had done tremendous amounts of work to actually try to unify the army under a distinctly political message all right in order to in order to make the army uh if you will the the guardian of loyalty of what loyalty meant in that day 
Could, could you very quickly though define for us these opposing camps within the army, mm -hmm. right? So let's talk about for our viewers, what's a Republican soldier look like in the Army of the Potomac? What's a Democratic one look like? Yeah, so I argue in this book that, that the majority of Union soldiers in the Army of the Potomac did not, did not enlist in the war with a deep, mature political ideology. Um, that, that they came to the war um, because the flag had been fired on, um, you know, the United States, as far as they understood it, was under attack. Um, and they were there to, uh, they were there to serve out of a relatively simplistic, but still very deeply felt sense of patriotism. Um, and to basically see the adventure that the war provided. Um, and, and so, you know, as, 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 as the time went on, um, those same soldiers became susceptible to the political argumentation that was going on in the camps by folks who were more politically aware than they were, especially those in the junior officer ranks, guys who had been, you know, white collar, um, you know, clerks, lawyers, um, students uh, before the war. Uh, and so, of course, they fell out into Republican and Democratic lines. And a Republican, well, I'll start with the Democrats, because they, in some ways they're the more interesting, I think, almost. Right. The, the Democrats in the Army of the Potomac, like Democrats across the North in the 1860s, place their understanding of wartime loyalty in the context of loyalty to the Constitution, okay, that despite the vicissitudes of war, loyalty to the Constitution must remain inviolate, basically. Um, and in the context of the army, I argue that meant that Democrats in the Union Army tended to believe that the place of the soldier in society, in, in the political discourse of society was not to have a loud voice, okay? The, the, the place of the soldier was to serve. That was by and large, I think, the, um, the, the viewpoint of a Democrat. Obviously not pleased with emancipation, not pleased with any sort of radicalizing um, influence on the war effort or on the army. Um, a Republican, on the other hand, would be someone who um, believed that the United States was basically, ha had been under the influence of a slave power um, in the 1850s, uh, which really primed these guys uh, to embrace emancipation as a necessary war aim. Um, they were deeply committed to Abraham Lincoln as the, um, the, the, the absolute paragon of a commander in chief. Um, they were ready to follow him to, to the death. And in terms of what that meant in the army, in the context like it, of civil military relations in the army, what I found was that the Republicans were much more willing to stick their necks out and influence the public discourse. So that by the time 1863 came around with the appearance of an anti-war wing of the Democratic Party, it was the army's Republicans who were beating the drum for harsh policy against the Confederacy and a very exacting understanding of loyalty on the home front. Zach, I'm wondering too about, uh, since you have Meade peering over your shoulder, I thought of this as well, uh, what your thoughts are on the effect that the uh, Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War had politically on the Army of the Potomac? Right. Um, the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, this, this very, um, this very harsh group of radical Republicans in Congress 
um, generally has a very chilling effect, I think, on the high command of the Army of the Potomac, because the high command of the Army of the Potomac, by and large, has, I think, a well-earned reputation of being McClellan Democrat sort of, um, uh, sort of complexion politically. Um, so obviously, the, the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, these radical Republicans who were really trying to put a backbone into the Army of the Potomac and, and root out any perception of disloyalty or lack of aggression, um, that had to have had a chilling effect on the part of the high command. What I found really interesting when I went into the into the research for the book was that a lot of these captains, majors, colonels at the lower, um, a little bit lower down in the chain of command, were very much, if not in complete agreement with the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, at least thought that they served a valuable purpose. They at least thought that they were that they're. Their, um, their interest in terms of keeping a watchful eye on the McClellan clique in the high command was going to um, shorten the war by making it harsher against the Confederacy than a lot of McClellan's acolytes might have, might have preferred. But do, you, but do you think that the Committee on the Conduct of War because they could wreck an officer's career. Do you think that that, that in, in a very specific way had an impact on command decisions, whether it be at the operational level or maybe even at the tactical level, which I recognize that at both of those levels, it would be hard to make a direct connection. I mean, some historians have suggested that Meade's performance uh, was subpar at Gettysburg because of his political, although he was kind of politically sort of neutered, or at least he kind right. of pretended that he was, which we need to get to that in just a moment. But I'm, that's really intrigues me what you said that some officers actually embraced, obviously Republican ones, the Committee on the Conduct of War. I'm curious about your thoughts though. Did it hinder the Army's, um, you know, its, its ability on the battlefield? Do you see officers really looking over their shoulder worrying that, hey, we're too aggressive. We make a mistake. We're going to end up in D.C. in front of the in front of the radicals. Yeah, I I, I definitely think there's an element of that. Um, sure, I think any time a commanding general feels like he doesn't have the support, um, the explicit support of the political leadership back in the capital, that's that's not a recipe for uh, guaranteed success. But again, what I what I really tried to try to dig into was, you know, what does what does the rank and file think of these guys? And because there hadn't been quite as much work done on that end. Um, and what was really interesting to me, looking at the leadership of the Army of the Potomac, was to see how this brief, well, relatively brief window in early 1863, when Joseph Hooker commands the Army of the Potomac is very different from the rest of the history of the Army of the Potomac, where it's led by um, a, you know, a McClellan or a McClellan White. Right, right, that's right. And, and Hooker um, definitely has friends among the radical Republicans in Washington, has friends on the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Uh, that didn't necessarily guarantee him success, of course, um, but uh, it, it was at least interesting to see that Hooker was, and, and to a lesser extent, I think his chief of staff, um, uh, Butterfield, were using these political channels populated by radicals like the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War um, to advance their own careers. And in so doing, really created the conditions for the Republican message to resonate in the army much more than it would have otherwise. So. In, in that sense, I think that the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War and its relationship with the High Command, at least during the Joseph Hooker interlude of Army of the Potomac Command, may have actually been a net positive. Um, but this, this it's an shift, interesting question. Yeah, this profound shift that you see with Hooker's ascension to command, that now you have a Republican at the home. If I recall uh, from your book, you found ample evidence in which 
um, the army try to limit the circulation of democratic linking right. uh, democratic party uh, newspapers um, and so let's get down on the ground here i mean the, the point that you continue to make is that this book is about in essence the rank and file or lower ranking officers mm -hmm. and how they navigated the war politically so tell us how did you because you, you didn't just look at letters you looked at a range of things yeah. tell us some of these other sources that gave us gave you this new dimension uh, that we hadn't seen before yeah well i you know i remember i think it, it might have been a comment that james mcpherson makes in one of his books or maybe it was it, any one of a half dozen books on on union soldier ideology that seemed to have appeared over the past couple of decades you know in, in essence made the point that we historians who are looking at what union soldiers thought about the war at its you know at its highest level the policy level the um the politics level we're really just combing through the same sources <laughs> we're really just combing through the same collection like of, of maybe a thousand fifteen hundred soldiers letters at various repositories around the country be it at um carlisle um, at the army heritage and education center there or at the library of congress or the new york state library whatever we're basically all looking through the same sources and trying to argue different things about what soldiers thought about the war so for me the priority was to try to access sources that had not been examined in great detail before. And ironically enough, for me, what that ended up being was um, newspapers. Newspapers, which were published sources, at least, you know, in, in wartime had been published sources, but um, had lain dormant for a long time. And now because of digitization and everything else, are now more accessible than ever before. And so what I was able to do, just spending lots and lots and lots of time in front of a computer was to look at um, as many newspaper sources as I could, finding along the way that soldiers wrote just thousands of letters to newspapers on the home front. And as the war went on, these letters became more and more heavily politicized. And so what was happening was this almost symbiotic relationship between soldiers who were becoming more politically aware as the war went on and newspaper editors who were very deeply political creatures in their own right, um, using each other to help define the political direction of the war. So I found just dozens and dozens and dozens of unit political resolutions passed during the war. I found lots and lots of uh, unit voting returns, which I had to take with a grain of salt because these are political um, messaging campaigns to a large extent by these newspaper editors. Um, so there was that. And, and I think the other portion of the original research that was most interesting to me, and this was actually something I picked up from uh, Timothy Orr's work on the Army of the Potomac, uh, which is extraordinary, is dig deep into what are called the adjutant general's papers throughout any of the northern capitals. So you go to Harrisburg, you go to Albany, or Columbus, as the case may be, um, and look through basically all of the communications that were written from soldiers at the front or people on the home front even to their governors through the adjutant general's office recommending promotions of soldiers from the ranks or ncos um, up to the junior officer level or something like that and these letters are just filled with promises of political loyalty. And so it's really fascinating to see. Just real quickly, John, you, can jump in. I just, you mentioned the source of the petitions. Could you describe to us what, what are these petitions um, that they then sent, the soldiers sent to the newspapers? What, right. What are, what, what are they exactly? I, I think it's, it's maybe one of the most important sources um, that historians haven't 
I mean, historians have looked at them, but um, just through lots and lots of digging, um, I was able to find a lot more than I think we knew existed. Um, and soldiers, this really started in early 1863 when the Copperhead movement appeared on the Northern home front, the anti-war democratic um, movement took hold in some places in the mid-Atlantic and the Midwest. Um, and soldiers were genuinely livid about the appearance of home front dissent. Um, and especially what appeared to them to be a pretty sophisticated militant home front uh, dissent. And so under the leadership of Joseph Hooker, because I think he was, I sort of had to read between the lines, but I, I definitely got the sense that he was very much involved in this mobilization process. Um, I found over 60 regiments in the Army of the Potomac whose officers, uh, captains, majors, and colonels got together, drafted um, very polished political resolutions denouncing the Copperheads, denouncing anybody who didn't subscribe to the notion of taking the war to the Confederacy in the harshest terms possible, um, and even going so far as to recommend that the administration send some of these troops home so they could actually take care of these Copperheads in the way soldiers would prefer to. Um, and then these officers, having written all this stuff up, would read them in front of the regiments. The regiment typically would offer some sort of enthusiastic huzzah or something like that. <laughs> and the resolutions would be sent off to any number of you know, Republican newspapers across the home front, which just ate this stuff up. And they reappeared periodically throughout the war. So they reappeared in the fall of 1863 during some of the gubernatorial campaigns in the North. Uh, they reappeared um, in the election of 1864, certainly as well. Speaking on the election of 1864, that one's always fascinated me, um, just because you have so many men in the field, so many men who are probably voting for the first time. Ever. That's right. And, and uh, because maybe they were like 17 when they joined and now are 18 and now they can vote because they're 21. Right. Um, what, what was the scene like for that, Zach? Where, where you just talked about his, uh, things being sent to the newspapers. Were men having like debates in the field, kind of like, you know, we used to hear about them having like plays in the field and camp to pass the time. Were they yeah. having like mock debates or, or real debates <laughs> that, that could get ugly? Uh, and, and we already had a question about this. How did these men vote in the field then in 1864? Um, generally speaking, I think the election of 1864 came off remarkably tame compared to uh, um, the, the possibilities, um, you know, the, the, the manner in which this election could have gone um, if things had been different. I think it actually, I think it actually came across um, pretty tame. The, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton issued very clear directives that they called it po political haranguing was to be kept to a minimum. Um, soldiers were not supposed to exhibit lots of um, debating about one party or the other. But that was difficult because in the case of Republicans, that meant ostensibly not being allowed to support the president. <laughs> so it looked very strange to them. Um, so each governor from a Northern state that had troops in the Army of the Potomac sent um, agents from each party to visit the front and deliver ballots. Because back then voting was done by party ballot. Um, it wasn't really a secret vote like we think of today. Um, it was a party ballot. And so Republican agents would visit the front and deposit piles of Republican ballots or National Union ballots, they would have called them because it was a, it was in theory, at least a coalition party of Republicans and some war Democrats who had joined Lincoln. Uh, and Democrats did the same thing. Occasionally, 
Democrats would be heckled when they visited the camp. Um, soldiers admitted that. Um, they denied some of the more sensationalist stories in Democratic papers, you know, that said soldiers were attacking them and, and all this and that. Um, the fact of the matter was the American ballot box in the 1850s and 1860s was the scene of rampant um, strong arming, fraud, all sorts of very nefarious things. Um, the military atmosphere of the Civil War probably helped mitigate that to some extent. Um, so the election did come off fairly tame. Um, but uh, yeah, it was one of these situations where I actually found, you know, one Democratic agent writing back to, I think it was like the New York Herald or one of the other Democratic papers saying that there were, he, he went to the front, he went to the Army of the Potomac and he saw disgraceful, that was his term, disgraceful acts of soldiers upholding the administration, his words, which is a really bizarre thing to think about. Yeah. Um, and I think it was equally bizarre for a lot of Union soldiers to think about as well. Um, so what I found was that uh, the Army of the Potomac, like all the Union field armies, it did vote overwhelmingly for Lincoln. Um, and digging a little bit deeper, uh, what I found was that practically every state that sent troops into the Army of the Potomac, with the exception of Vermont and New York, New York was a big exception, Vermont not quite so much, um, every other state, uh, their soldiers in the Army of the Potomac voted at least 20% higher for Lincoln than their um, families and friends back on the home front. And so it was interesting in the book to talk about why New York especially was such an exception, uh, probably because uh, vastly more immigrants uh, from New York, probably because at least according to the accounts from soldiers at the front, lots and lots more recruits, conscripts, and other late arrivals into the army who I argue did not have the same sort of political education that their comrades had had earlier in the war about taking on the copperheads and taking the war to the enemy. Um, and I can't discount the fact that unlike most other Northern states, the governor of New York in 1864, um, at least leading up to the 1864 election, was a very strong anti-administration Democrat, Horatio Seymour. And Seymour had very consciously stacked the officer ranks of the Army of the Potomac with Democratic officers. Um, and so there were instances where Democratic officers tried to convince their men, just as Republican officers did. And New York officers seem to have been a little bit more successful in that regard than most other states. And Vermont was an exception just because the Vermont Brigade from the Sixth Corps was all about John Sedgwick and all about George McClellan. They're all Democrats. And they're all Democrats. <laughs> That's awesome. you know, but, you know, Zach, is, that's something that I want to uh, sort of piece together here. You know, in reading your book, it challenged a sort of a, a cherished assumption that I've always sort of held to. Uh -oh. uh -oh. and, and, and something that I used to tell my students. And that is, you know, it's kind of a, almost a celebration of the Union soldier, you know, Lincoln's thinking bayonets. Yeah. And then we see that idealism come through. And certainly their conception of union, uh, you know, it's inspiring that they, they feel that they have a mission and it is a mission to preserve the liberties that are, that the founders, right, had bequeathed to us. That's all, and I'm not doubting any of that. But then the resolutions, those mm -hmm. resolutions are chilling. They're chilling, yeah. They're chilling because these men, their notion of how to deal with dissent is you deal with it through violence. Mm -hmm. These men are eager to get home and let's be blunt, bash some heads, 
shoot some copperheads. And listen, like I'm talking about anybody who questions the war effort. Right? And that is, again, I, I can't think of another example, and maybe John can or you can as well, in US military history in which soldiers are so open and so vocal and publishing in newspapers that if you oppose me, I'm coming back home and I'm going after you. So that's the first thing I'd like for you to comment. So we'll follow that away, you can get back to that. And I, we, John and I talked to Harold Holzer about this. And we want this 1864 election to also be a testament to American commitment to democracy, even in a time of war. And I'm telling you, it is a sham. The 1864 election, yeah, it's a shock. It's shocking to me that it occurred, but it's not a democratic election. It's not even close to being a democratic election. And it's not just because democratic soldiers were intimidated a little bit. Mm -hmm. Man, it was orchestrated from the administration to ensure that old Abe got the votes. Now look, a side note, I'm glad they did what they did, right? I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they made this turn out the way it did. I'm not, I'm not upset about the outcome. I'm just saying that I think that this is problematic in a very critical way. Americans don't understand a democracy. They're so cynical about politicians for so many reasons. But one reason is, as you just already alluded to, elections have never been clean in the 19th century. The 1864 one was pretty dirty. And we need to understand that a democracy is getting in the gutter, right? It always has been, it is to this day. Uh, and so let's go back about my comment about the resolutions or petitions yeah. and about the election. Am I, do you feel some of the sort of, I'm not, how am I gonna say? Disappointment, right? Disappointment, or, well, that I sort of, or maybe again that it sort of came to my attention. No, I understand. I, I understand. I understand your comment very well, and I think, um, as Civil War historians, we're abundantly aware of the fact that we live in this moment in Civil War literature that seems to be revisionist and reductionist, and and some people call it the dark turn. You know where you, know, you think the Civil War was nostalgic. You know it's 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 it, it it was a it was a great American experience and and um, much of Civil War literature over the past generation has been about um, if not obliterating that notion, then at least chipping away at the edges and getting us to realize how dark some of it really was. Um, and so when I was writing this book, I was thinking about my gosh where does my story fit in the Civil War as the dark turn um, or, or current literature on the Civil War as the dark turn in Civil War studies? The resolutions fit right in, in that regard. Um, and what was interesting to me, I, I did not approach this project in terms of my graduate training from the perspective of a Civil War historian um, because I was working with Mark Grimsley and working at Ohio State in their military history program I was coming at this from the perspective of a military historian, someone trained to look more broadly, especially at Western military history, principally Europe, um, which is what I teach to my army officers today. I teach European military history predominantly. And so what I saw was the extent to which you see ever so brief glimmers in the story of the Army of the Potomac and maybe just the story of the Northern war effort as a whole, you see brief glimmers of the English Civil War, hmm. the French Revolution, brief glimmers. Those political resolutions that the Army puts out in the spring of 63 that continue again into the autumn of 63, the autumn of 64, these are documents that perhaps belong more to the French Revolution than they do our Civil War, mm -hmm. as, it's, as it's often conceived of. Um, but it tells you something, I think, just to get back to maybe, maybe the more uplifting side to, to eschew the dark term for just a second, you know, getting back to sort of the, the more optimistic view of the Civil War that you were, um, that you were waxing eloquent about a minute ago, I think it it provides some solace to see that in the context of our civil war, um, 
we did not go down the path of the French Revolution, despite the fact that the army um, toyed with those sorts of yeah, concepts on occasion. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a nice comparison. I never thought of it that way. That's <laughs> how to look at it differently now is that in that regard. Well, uh, and, and John, you were talking about the, the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War right. um, uh, a, a little while back. And uh, the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War strikes us as, as, as frightening um, mm -hmm. to some extent, you know, because these are guys who are um, very, very deeply invested in a particular political message, a divisive political message, and they are interjecting themselves into military affairs mm -hmm. in a way that we traditionally would think of as inappropriate and overbearing. Um, but it's still nothing compared to what French armies in the 1790s actually saw when they had what were called representatives on mission who followed the army to police political loyalty. And the difference was that in the Army of the Potomac, if you, if you weren't found to be exhibiting the sort of exacting standard of loyalty that the North expected by 1863, you could be fired, mm. not beheaded, not in front of a firing squad, <laughs> right. but right. but fired. Right. Um, Your career. And for for all of the rhetoric of violence that soldiers um, utilize in their resolutions, we don't have that many instances of soldiers attacking copperheads like crazy on the home front. Don't get me wrong. The Army of the Potomac was very happy when they heard that regiments were being sent to New York City in July 1863. Mm -hmm. And some of them were really disappointed when they got there too late. Yeah, um, yeah. But still, yeah. it's something to, something to consider, I think. Yeah. John, did we have any questions that have come through uh, Facebook? Uh, I have one that I would like to pose to, to sure. Zach while I'm looking through there, actually. It's kind of a kind of a wild card question because you know how I am but this is an interesting question I think for our viewers because some people uh, study one side or the other and I'm wondering mm -hmm. Zach what uh, how does the their opponents compare in their political discourse as far as that's concerned so you, you were talking about the Army of the Potomac obviously is our major thing tonight but yeah do, do we see instances uh, that are parallel in the experience with the ANV, with the Army of Northern Virginia, because it is an antebellum political American experience. Yeah, so this is, this is something that I'd very much like to dig into in a future project. So I'll put a disclaimer up, up there right now, but um, I've, I've dabbled in the research enough to tell that exactly the same political phenomenon that you see in the Army of the Potomac in March and April of 1863, when all these resolutions attack the Copperheads, exactly the same phenomenon happens among basically all of Robert E. Lee's North Carolina regiments in August 1863. Right after the Battle of Gettysburg, when, um, uh, uh, what is it, Holden's, um, mm -hmm. Uh, element of of uh, the North Carolina essentially peace movement um, gets some some headway there, and these uh, regiments of North Carolinians, regiments that had been, I mean, the 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 North Carolina regiments that lead the rhetorical charge against the peace movement, the anti-war movement in North Carolina, are the regiments that belonged to Alfred Iverson at Gettysburg, the regiments that got absolutely destroyed on the first day, okay, suffered 50, 60% casualties. These are the guys a month later who are doing exactly the same thing that their union counterparts did earlier in the year, saying we are ready to take it to the anti-war protesters because we believe that firmly in the cause. And it's almost like you can see in the Army of Northern Virginia, or at least among the North Carolina regiments in the late summer of 63, the same thing happening after the horrible experience of Gettysburg that the Army of the Potomac saw after the horrible experience of Fredericksburg and the Mud March. Mm -hmm. They are taking it out on the anti-war protesters 
and developing a new sense of political cohesion by doing so. Zach, I'm eager uh, to see your work on that project and hope that it'll come to, uh, to UNC for a book. I just wanna throw this out there just to give it some consideration. Have you ever thought, especially in, in, uh, in relationship to the Army in Northern Virginia, that all these resolutions, they're manufactured by the officers. I mean, I've read accounts where a guy named, uh, this guy, William Wagner, who was in Avery's Brigade after Gettysburg, he wrote to his wife and he said, those resolutions, he said, we didn't vote that way. We didn't vote to continue the war. All the officers are lying. And that's a real challenge with these sources because you've done a masterful job with them, I think with the Army of the Potomac. I think you'll have your work cut out for you. So I think what you'll find is that those resolutions are very much about exerting political control, not manipulation, but it's political control of that discourse, right? So that it creates uh, the perception, the facade, that there's unity when I don't think the Army of North, Northern Virginia was as unified as those resolutions would suggest. It's gonna be, I mean, it's gonna be fascinating when you, when you go down that road. There's a story uh, in your book that I'd like for you to, to share with our audience. I think it's a, a fascinating one. And, and also again, speaks to your central argument. And it's about the ceremonial sword um, that um, was to be given to George B. McClellan after Gettysburg. Yeah. And I just, I, I don't know if John read that part. I want John to guess uh, the officers well, I've sort of given it away. Yeah. Uh, well, it's surprising that there's a ceremonial sword yeah. that's going to be given to George B. McClellan. So, John, who do you think led the charge to give this sword to George B. McClellan? Oh, wow. It's in the Army of the Potomac. That's where it's coming from. Any guesses? No. There's so yeah, many. I would have said Sedgwick, right? Yeah, I, that, that would have been uh, one candidate. All right. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few. Zach, give us the answer, please. So I think Sedgwick had something to do oh, with you do? it. Okay, good. I do. I do think Sedgwick had something to do with it. Um, it's, it's this fascinating episode in September of 1863 when there develops in a certain circle of the Army of the Potomac's high command, uh, the notion of getting the whole army to subscribe and collect money for a gift to George McClellan. And as I was doing the research for the book, came across lots of newspaper references to what they called the McClellan testimonial. And they, that they called, you know, that, that's a testimonial is a gift to um, a superior officer to, to show your, um, your devotion to him or your appreciation for him. Um, and when I dug into the letter collections and diaries, um, I found in George McClellan's papers at the Library of Congress, a number of letters written by his brother, his younger brother, Arthur McClellan, who was a staff officer in the Sixth Corps, Sedgwick's Corps. And Arthur McClellan tells us all about the McClellan testimonial from the inside. And he says, the whole scheme was devised by Henry Hunt, um, a very staunch McClellanite who commanded the Army of the Potomac's artillery, a phenomenal officer in every other respect. Um, Martin McMahon, who was a staff officer along with Arthur McClellan at Sixth Corps headquarters. Um, and then I think his name was Nelson Davis, um, Meade's assistant inspector general or something like that. Um, regardless, it's clear that uh, Meade knew a great deal about this. Yeah. Um, Arthur McClellan's letters tell us that Meade supported it wholeheartedly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and digging into it, you see that uh, the army was encouraged that they actually, the, the general headquarters in the Army of the Potomac printed and circulated um, this, this memo saying, this is what we expect each rank to contribute to the McClellan testimonial. Uh, so major generals were uh, asked to contribute $25. Um, and, and a major general's pay in 1863, I think it was $450 a month. Uh, so not an, 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 an unsubstantial amount. 
um, private soldiers were asked to donate like 25 cents or 50 cents or something like that. Um, and so, you know, the junior officer contribution fell out accordingly. And what I found was that um, I think it was the fifth corps, George Sykes's corps, uh, donated $12,000 or, or raised $12,000. If every one of the seven infantry corps in the Army of the Potomac um, actually raised $12,000, then we're talking something in today's money on the order of like $2 million, okay? <laughs> a gift of that magnitude for George B. McClellan. This is not just a sword. In other words, this is, this is a big deal. Right. So it becomes a political firestorm for the army. And of course, it makes its way back to Washington, mm -hmm. where the Lincoln administration quashes it very quickly. <laughs> it, it, it says something about, it's, it's a remarkable, right? And mm -hmm. what's remarkable is the, the bust of uh, your man over your, your left shoulder, Zach, of, of Meade. A, a guy who claims he's not really political. And, and I mean, I don't, what does that say about Meade, except that he maybe doesn't have a great political sense that's for damn sure right I mean, there's I think, one thing i don't what's it say about me then i i had to deal with that because i wanted to like george gordon mead um as i think anybody who grew up studying the battle of gettysburg as a pastime does um i do not believe that george gordon mead was this nefarious mini mcclellan basically um, you know, this, this, this McClellan White, um, who was always scheming to upset the radicals. I don't think that was the case. I do think, however, that Meade was incredibly political, uh, politically tone deaf. Um, and, and, that, and, and I think that's just par for the course for a lot of regular army Democrats in the Army of the Potomac. They do not believe that it is the army's place to be arguing politics in the public sphere. But what Meade doesn't realize by 1863, in large part because his own army has thrown down the gauntlet politically in the northern public sphere, is that refraining from politics by 1863 is in itself a political act. Absolutely. And he doesn't realize that. And I don't think he ever does. And he's not savvy with the press as well. I mean, but there is so much to admire about him, sure. I believe, and particularly after Gettysburg, where I he subordinated his ego time and time again in a command structure that still this, to this day makes no sense to me yep. whatsoever yep. as well. Zach, very quickly, could you just tell folks, because your career path uh, after you received your PhD at Ohio State is not one of uh, National Park Service. It's not one of sort of the academy. So could you tell us a little bit about sort of what you do? Uh, I think people, especially young historians out there, I think they'd be intrigued um, by your profession. Yeah, I, um, I teach in what's called professional military education. Um, so I am, as you mentioned, an assistant professor at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, uh, which means that I Peter, like you teach undergraduates, I teach Army officers. Um, so I teach predominantly Army captains and majors, uh, almost all of whom are at least five years older than I am. I had my first student this term who was younger than I was, uh, <laughs> uh, younger than I am. Um, but when I came out of graduate school with my PhD, I got a, um, I was very fortunate, very blessed to get a one year uh, non-renewable um, assistant professorship at West Point. Mm -hmm. So I got to teach um, U.S. Military Academy cadets um, who were the most phenomenal students imaginable. Right. Um, not to denigrate other yeah, undergraduates, right. but the, the, um, the motivation mm -hmm. that they have even on their bad days um, surpasses anything I had any right to expect as a, as a, a professor. So that experience convinced me that I wanted to continue teaching for the military. Um, and actually about halfway through that visiting assistant professorship, I got an offer for a permanent position with the Command and General Staff College. Um, so my job basically entails teaching Army officers the military history of the Western world. So what is 
the military tradition that they imbue today. Right. Um, so we look at European military history really from 1650 to the mid 1900s. And I get to do staff rides to Civil War battlefields. Yeah, that's great. It's tremendous. Yeah, yeah switching those. So switching I those very, out. very highly recommend it to anybody uh, who's looking out there and saying, you know, it's not just that the job market's bleak, because sometimes it is, um, but this is a really good opportunity to engage with some phenomenal students. Um, Pete froze up, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think he did. Well, Zach, I, I want to thank you for coming on, and we we got the book plugged, right, Pete? Yes. It's in the it's in the description. There it is, Republican ranks. Uh, there's the the code is in the description as well. And I saw thank you to everyone in the comments because some people actually commented with the code, so people <laughs> could actually get it and remember it. Yeah. And that's all in the description of the live stream. Let going. me just add here to, to, to close. I've got an, another idea. Uh, if uh, the little one who arrives in July, and is, hear me out here, Zach, <laughs> I think you should name him after Jim Harbaugh because, hell, he's never beat Ohio State and he never will. So, I mean, does that work? <laughs> I'll throw you for a loop. It's a girl. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to and, get and our it, research team on that. If it weren't a girl, it was going to be named after um, uh, either a Revolutionary War figure for my wife or a Civil War general for me. So. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Hey, Zach, man, such a pleasure. Again, to see you, you know, as this kid on the battlefield. And for those cynics out there who say, you know, we don't have a younger generation who cares about Civil War past. We do. And they are fine historians, as this book is proof of. And so, Zach, thank you again so much for thank joining you. us. Uh, John, who's with us, I think, on another young historian is with us on Monday. It yeah. is Ben Roy. Yes, Ben Roy is with us on Monday. And this is right within John's wheelhouse because the topic is? Historians in the Civil War, isn't it? And comparing <laughs> Civil War soldiers to soldiers in World War I. Yes. Which, so uh, this is this is right up my alley. So that's right up your alley. Yeah, yeah. This is gonna be good. You, John, you keep working on our uh, our our theme song. <laughs> I, I made the mistake, Zach, of saying Eddie one. Eddie Mercury instead of Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. Yeah, yeah I heard I'm that. Sorry, I'm never gonna he, live that down. Zach heard about that. The entire <laughs> internet was talking about it, Peter. The yeah. entire least, I once said. Yeah. I actually saw it. I actually saw it on CNN. CNN, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, anything, anything to bring some. Comic relief, even at my own expense, my own honor, I'll do it for the team. Hey, I'm a self-deprecating kind of guy. I'm a historian. I have to be self-deprecating. So. <laughs> hey, Party thanks time. again, Zach. We appreciate it, man. Have a nice evening. And Thank you. Hope everyone out there stays Thank healthy you. and happy. And uh, John, we'll see you on Monday. Yep. Take care, everybody. See you on Monday. Thanks. Take care, Zach.